Now, the issue of U.S. detention policy was a priority for President Obama in 2008, but not so much in the most recent election. There is at this point strong opposition, bipartisan opposition, I might add, to closing the facility at Guantanamo Bay. Um, but this issue of detention is not only about Guantanamo Bay. It's uh, also, for example, about the conflict in Mali, uh, where quite a few militants have been captured by French forces. And this raises some new questions. Among them, does reluctance to detain unlawful enemy combatants lead to killing them instead? If France prefers to turn combatants over to Malian forces, will they be treated worse? And should that be a cause for concern? And if so, to whom? Which national or transnational authorities should play a role and or shoulder responsibilities here? Governments and the media seem reluctant to reopen the debate over detention, but these issues are far from settled. So to address them, I'd like to turn to our esteemed panelists. We'll get the conversation going. And then before too long, we'll open the discussion uh, for questions and some comments to all of you. I know that this session is on the record. If you have cell phones, please silence them. And I'm going to turn first to David, and I want to start with some of the basics because there are things that confuse me here, David. For example, what do we mean by preventive detention? Are all those who are detained at Guantanamo under preventive detention? Surely that's not an apt description for Sheikh Khalid Mohammed and his status. And, and in Mali, it seems to me if French forces break down a door and arrest an unarmed Tuareg suspected of uh, being in cahoots with the jihadists, that's preventive detention. But if that same, G, that same Tuareg uh, was behind his house and just fired an RPG at a French tank, then I'm not sure the term applies. So let me, uh, let, me let you uh, explain to us the parameters, legal and other. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, when we talk about preventive detention, I, I think it's, it's very important to disaggregate that concept uh, from the concept of, of war crimes. Um, Gitmo uh, does host people uh, who fall into both camps. Um, on the one hand, uh, preventive detention is something which is as old as warfare itself. And the reason one would detain preventively um, is quite clear. That uh, in a war, if you have a member of the enemy force who is captured, um, and then you simply release them, they will go back to the battle. Uh, in the context of traditional warfare, that is state-to-state -state conflict, um, it's rather settled law uh, within the Geneva Conventions how you deal with someone who is preventively detained, uh, a member of the enemy force who's captured, which is that you, you hold them until the cessation of hostilities. Uh, when it comes to uh, both what we faced post-9-11 and also uh, what's occurring in Mali and elsewhere, uh, it becomes a much more complex situation. Uh, members of the enemy force don't necessarily uh, or generally don't wear uniforms. And uh, also, it's not clear, particularly in the context of the war on terror, what it means to have cessation of hostilities. Uh, traditionally, you don't know when a war is going to end, but you're pretty sure it's not going to go on for 10 or 20 or 30 years. We don't do 30-year war, wars anymore. Uh, whereas in this conflict, uh, the, what we call the global war on terror or whatever uh, the term du jour for it is, uh, it's not clear what the cessation of hostilities is going to be. That being said, uh, I think that there still is uh, a need for preventive detention, for refining the system, as opposed to the current consensus which we have, which is basically that Western countries don't do preventive detention. And the reason why I think that's important, Cliff, is the reasons that you put your finger on, particularly uh, in warfare situations, people are going to be detained, period. And if the U.S. is out of that business, if France is out of that business, um, then it's going to end up falling to local forces, where often people will be treated worse. Uh, prisons in Somalia, uh, and preventive detention is occurring in Somalia, carried out by Somali forces. Um, there's just no comparison. You would much rather be held in Gitmo or held by Western forces than be held in Somalia. Um, likewise, in Mali, uh, where the human rights abuse is being carried out by Malian forces uh, against both Tuaregs uh, and also against Arabs uh, has been reported and rather horrifically. Um, I think France... Uh, being unwilling to take part in this, in part because of the Gitmo consensus that we have, is something that will end up producing human rights abuses that are worse than if France were involved. Hmm. Then you want to comment on that? And uh, do you agree with what uh, David said, or do you have a different perspective? Uh, no, I largely agree with that. Um, so, I, so first of all, I, I, I think it's um, 
a, a, a little bit churlish uh, to focus on the French here because the the prime um, um, bad actor in this regard is us. Um, American detention policy is a total mess. Um, and it's a mess for exactly the reasons that David just described with respect to uh, the French action in, in Mali, um, which is that we're ashamed of engaging in detention, and so we desperately want to pretend that we don't do it. Um, we do do it. Um, and we try to hide the ways that we do it, mostly from ourselves, um, through a variety of mechanisms. One is um, we use proxy forces in the countries in which we operate. Um, we turned over a very large number of detainees in Iraq to the Iraqi government. Now, some of this, you'll say, and you'll be correct, is the uh, simply productive and valuable um, standing up of a government that's capable of running its own affairs, including handling its own detainees, and that's correct. But some of it is very convenient. A very large number of people were turned over to the Iraqi government by U.S. forces. Very few of them were better treated as a consequence of that. And mostly um, the human rights community um, pushed that outcome uh, despite its human rights consequences. Um, so number two, so our, our first thing is that we rely on proxy forces. Our second thing is that we pretend we are um, doing things, we, we, we pretend that <coughs> issues like Guantanamo are legacy questions of a prior era of bad conduct rather than a persistent ongoing feature that requires a strategy and law of, of detention um, for certain people. Um, I don't believe that's the case. Um, and the third thing as part of that, as part of that pretense that this is simply a legacy problem, um, we, uh, we design our policies in ways that actually in some ways make them worse. Um, and so there are a lot of things that Raha and I disagree about in this space, but I, I, I suspect that this is one that we agree with. We say we are closing Guantanamo. We are not closing Guantanamo, whether one thinks that's a good thing or a bad <clears throat> thing. Um, we have a policy that's basically on autopilot in which we say we're doing one thing that everybody knows that we're not. And we thus do not have the conversation, what should we do with certain categories of detainees? How should we handle a group of, for example, Yemenis who um, may pose individually relatively little risk, but we're very, very afraid of the circumstances in their country. We don't really have that conversation the way we should, partly because we layer it under, under a larger series of, of pretenses about what our policies actually are. Um, number three, um, we have one of the pretenses that is, I think, most destructive. Um, is that this is something we are not going to do again in the future. Um, and the result of that is that, on the one hand, that we um, rely on, you know, to a great extent, we rely on proxy forces to do our detention for us. And at the same time, we leave ourselves without a detention facility to use in those relatively rare cases right now when we actually do need to do it. Um, Right now, we're capturing people in very small numbers. And as long as the numbers stay small, you can do the investigative work that you need to process new entrants, new captures through the criminal justice system. Um, and so in that context, you can say, well, we're never going to bring anyone new to Guantanamo, which is actually the administration's formal position. The Afghan government does not let us use Bagram for people captured out of theater. And the result of this is, and there's no other facility in which we maintain this, this sort of, other than ships, which by the way have been pressed into certain uses as a result of this. Um, there's no other facility where you can bring, um, without the permission of the local government, people who you may capture. Um, and so 
Uh, the result is that, you know, there have been these very embarrassing moments for the administration where senior military officers, particularly Admiral McRaven, was asked in congressional testimony, well, what do you do if you capture someone who's a serious bad guy and you don't have an immediate criminal case to make against him? The military doesn't really do that in criminal cases. Um, and, you, you know, and McRaven basically testified, well, we'd have to let him go because we can't, we, we, as a matter of policy, we can't bring him to Guantanamo. And as a matter of Afghan policy, we can't bring him to Bagram. Um, this is a very destructive box to have talked yourself into. And so what I would say is you can improve significantly the human rights conversation. You can improve significantly the United States' strategic posture. And you can end a certain reliance on uh, often quite distasteful proxy forces if you are willing to have an honest conversation about the circumstances in which we should and should not engage in law of war detention and more broadly preventive detention outside of the laws of war. Let me, before we go on, just push back a little bit because I think a little bit, bit of disagreement is edifying for, for sure. in these kinds of discussions. And I don't disagree with your general point that our policy is fairly incoherent at the, this moment. But when you say it's churlish to discuss what's going on in Mali, I would argue that it's not in the sense that people are being arrested every day in Mali, and we can expect a lot more of that, and to say, well, they have, let's not discuss that. I'm not sure I understand why, since this is happening right now. Oh. Like, let me go through and I'll let you respond. Yeah, yeah of course. And meanwhile, as you point out, in Guantanamo, we are not, and we have not for the past four years, been adding to that population. Um, in fact, what we've probably been doing is a lot more killing of terrorists who could otherwise, who might otherwise be able to be captured under our under law as interpreted by the Justice Department. We are supposed to capture anyone that's feasible to capture. But we found it feasible to capture no one in the last four years. One has to wonder if part of the reason for that is a reluctance to add to the population uh, at, at Guantanamo. And uh, and I think you're right that. Uh, <laughs> We may be saying we'd like to close Guantanamo, but there is no way that that is going to happen, and there is bipartisan obje objection to doing so because we don't know what that would mean. It would mean bringing people back here and giving every detainee at Guantanamo essentially the same rights as a U.S. citizen once they landed, and even and neither Democrats nor Republicans are prepared to do that. So uh, again, my wider point here is that what's going on in Mali is important and should be examined. It's current and it's happening, and there will be more of it. And uh, although I do agree with you that Guant our, our, our policy in terms of detention in Guantanamo is fairly incoherent and may be leading to the killing of quite a few more uh, terrorists than would, necess would be necessary if we were detaining. Um, so I, let me just clarify about Mali. I did not mean it's inappropriate to talk about Mali. I, I just meant focusing on the French as, a, 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 you know, sort of exhibit A of the problem right here seems to me to be a, um, you know, I, I've been writing for the past 10 years about the problems of U.S. detention policy. And, you know, it's interesting to me that, that you know, there's a sort of schadenfreude when the French experience some of the same problems. Um, we, we've been dealing with this problem for a while, and I, and I, and I, you know, I have no problem with talking about Mali, but I do think, you know, w w this is not a problem that the French uh, created. It's a problem that that all Western countries um, have, as we have developed societal anxieties about preventive detention. We've all sort of talked ourselves into a box, and we are um, we are at least as big a problem. Well, I, we 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 have our own problems in that regard. Um, I, I do want to push back for a moment just on your suggestion that we're killing people that we used to capture. Um, so I, I, I think this is, uh, you have to be careful about how you say that. Um, the main reason that we are capturing very few people right now, so almost everybody who was captured and who is now at Guantanamo, um, not everybody, but almost everybody, was captured in a very short space of time in the fall and uh, in the winter of 2001, 2002, when a very large number of Taliban and 
um, al-Qaeda forces tried to flee into Pakistan and were kind of caught en masse, um, or in large groups, and turned over to U.S. forces. Um, the reason we are capturing so few people now is that we are largely, the, the modality of American counterterrorism action right now is largely in the form of projecting force into places that we don't in fact have boots on the ground, like you know the tribal areas of Pakistan, um, in Yemen, um, and in, to a lesser extent in you know parts of parts of Africa. Um, and you know this is not an environment in which you're going to be capturing large numbers of people. And I don't believe that there is ever been a, a policy we're afraid of the litigation consequences um, of detaining people or we're afraid of you know the political consequences of detaining them so please shoot them instead I, I, I really don't I, I really do not think that is what's happened um, I do think and I have you know the, the extent to which I agree with your point is that I do think you do have to worry when you create a great encumbrance around detention, and you create a great deal of anxiety, legal, policy, social, about whether it's moral, whether it's ethical, whether it's legal to detain people who pose a threat, you do have to worry in a kind of law and economics sort of way about what the incentives that that creates are. Um, and so I think the, the concern that underlies the, the, your point is certainly a valid one, and I share, but I worry about the hard presentation of it as, you know, we're killing a lot of people whom we used to capture. Raha, you want to comment on whether or not uh, schadenfreude plays a role? Are we enjoying the French dilemma too much? Um, well, I, I just, I want to take a step back a little bit and just think about, you know, it's easy to say... You know, I well. First of all, I agree 100% that the question of proxy forces um, and proxy detention regimes and the human rights abuses associated with them is is central to this question, um, and it needs to be dealt with head on. Um, in my view, the answer isn't let's just take them all and put them in Guantanamo. Uh, we need to take a step back and think about why this is happening in the first place. And, you know, it, it wasn't just the Obama administration that stopped sending people to Guantanamo and made a decision to try to close the facility. This was actually a decision made during the Bush administration. Um, so I do think it's easy just to say, well, let's put all these non-state non violent actors in Guantanamo without thinking through the very practical and policy consequences that those responsible for the policy, you know, were faced with at the time. And I think the bottom line is this. Um, Guantanamo as a matter of law and policy has become toxic for some fundamental reasons and those reasons are this. Um, essentially countries around the world do not want to consent to sending terrorism suspects to Guantanamo or any facility that engages in what's called preventive detention in part because of disagreements about the law around it and in part about disagreements about the ethics around it. Um, so. I think that whether or not you believe it's a moral thing, I mean, that is a, that's an important question, but there are some important policy consequences around that as well. And if you talk to folks at DOD, and I have talked to some of them, um, they'll tell you they don't want to be in the detention business, whether it's at Guantanamo or at Bagram in Afghanistan. And that's because, in many ways, a large-scale footprint, a detention presence in a country, especially um, a country in which you're fighting an armed conflict, um, can shift the center of gravity and as a matter of strategy can be quite <coughs> corrosive to the larger efforts to actually um, secure the population, to make progress against um, whatever organized armed group, if it's the Taliban or, or insurgent forces in Mali, um, that you might be dealing with. Um, I do think there's a, also a broader question about, you know, you would ask the question, you know, what, it, what are the appropriate parameters? And I think it's, a, it's very important to get that clear. Uh, preventive detention or internment, um, indefinite detention as some like to call it, is generally only appropriate in armed conflict. And when I say armed conflict, I mean that as a legal term of art. Um, uh, Non-international armed conflict in this case between a state actor like, for example, United States forces and a non-state actor like, let's say, Al-Qaeda, um, where there are ongoing sustained hostilities, where there is an organized you know, command presence on the other side, someone that we could call a party 
to the armed conflict. What we're really facing right now, and I would encourage you all to take a look at uh, Ben's colleague, Bobby Chesney, wrote a law review article that's really fascinating. Um, you know, we are facing some destabilizing forces in the global war on terror, where really it's becoming difficult for the government, the United States government and coalition partners, to sustain this idea of what's called the global war on terror. Um, because what we're really facing is a series of inchoate threats from networks, cells, perhaps groups that may be ideologically aligned with Al-Qaeda, but no longer tend to look like a party to the armed conflict in the sense of maintaining active training, military facilities, an organized command structure. Uh, in short, and you know, I, I don't want to reduce this too simply, but in short, we're looking at a terrorism that a, ter a terrorist threat um, that is much different than the Al Qaeda led by Osama bin Laden that hit us on 9/11, and 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 has certainly you know poses a threat, but doesn't face that same kind of um, uh, say, doesn't pose that same kind of existential threat as some like to call it that we had once faced. Uh, the the former DOD General Counsel Jay Johnson actually gave a very interesting set of remarks last fall where he posed the question, um, there will be a point in time, a tipping point, uh, so to speak, where we will know, we will have to say that Al Qaeda is no longer capable of strategic attacks against the United States and we're no longer in an armed conflict. At which point in time I would submit that this question of, you know, preventive detention, indefinite detention is no longer perspective, as uh, Ben puts it, and ought to be something where we focus more on the question of law enforcement, intelligence, diplomatic capabilities, capabilities that, by the way, will be on the strongest legal footing, um, and, and less on this question of Guantanamo, which, frankly, most operators who um, are looking at this question would say is not a long-term sustainable solution for dealing with violent non-state actors. May, may I just clarify something? Uh -huh. I, I actually, you know, I, I have never uh, had a particular brief for Guantanamo, and and you know my my argument is not that we need to maintain Guantanamo, though I observe as a factual matter that Guantanamo isn't closing. Um, my argument is that you need an answer to to the question that McRaven was was presented with, and that we currently have no answer to. And and I'm sort of agnostic, actually. I think there's a, there, there's a variety of potential right answers or reasonable answers to that question, but I don't think it's reasonable to have no answer to that question. Right. Uh, what, what I'd add also, I think you, you raised, uh, Raha, a number of, of uh, very good points. Um, first of all, when it comes to, uh, I, I, I very much disagree uh, with the notion that we're reaching a point uh, where Al Qaeda will simply not be able to strike at the U.S. I, I saw the speech as well. Um, I simply think that that's wrong. That's a little bit neither here nor there, though. Uh, it gets into kind of an arcane debate about the state of Al Qaeda, which I'm on one side of and lots of other people are on the other side of. Uh, but I think it's it's actually a mistake to make this debate all about Al Qaeda and all about transnational terrorism. Um, obviously, that's what originated it, and that's what many of the legal authorities for Guantanamo are based on. But I think when we look internationally at uh, certain major trends, one thing we can see is that non-state actors, uh, for technological reasons primarily, are being strengthened at the expense of the state. Um, you know, we have multiple countries uh, where non-state actors are able to challenge the state in ways that they just couldn't previously. Second, you have globalization um, in multiple ways, including because of the internet, uh, including because of, of increased ability to travel, which means that problems tend to migrate in ways that they didn't before. Uh, when we look at North Africa and um, you know, recent terrorist attacks, whether one wants to say that that's more regional or whether one wants to say that that's based, that rooted in Al-Qaeda transnational networks, we can see how uh, you know, an individual released in Egypt, Mohammed Jamal, was able to go to Libya and set up training camps there. Um, then uh, the Jamal network played a role in the attack on the U.S. Embassy in Benghazi. Uh, also, Libyan training facilities then played a role in a major attack uh, in Algeria against the Inarmenis facility. Um, and that that was inspired by an the French intervention in Mali. So all these various countries uh, and networks uh, spanning five different countries you know, converge in multiple violent incidents. I think that as a result of that, you know, the issue of, of preventive detention, what do you do when you have a state situation spiral out of control um, such that some hostile actor takes power? 
whether it's you know uh, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and its allies in northern Mali or some other actor, how do you deal with that? I think that's fundamentally a question we are absolutely going to have to deal with in the 21st century because of you know one other trend, which is increased resource scarcity, um, and uh, which makes it much more difficult to run a state. Um, you know, the price of oil uh, is increasing, regardless of, of uh, unconventional oil supplies. Um, you know, energy is becoming more expensive. Resources are becoming more expensive. We're going to see more states collapse. Um, as a result of that, I think Ben is absolutely right that we actually do need an answer. Uh, and Raha is absolutely correct. Gitmo is absolutely toxic. It's absolutely toxic. But that's why I think it's so important to actually loop the French in here, not out of a sense of schadenfreude, uh, but rather because Gitmo is generally thought of as being an American problem. The U.S. has this problem. There's a lot of schadenfreude, I would say, uh, that is pointed at the U.S. internationally. And the fact that other countries are going to have to deal with this problem set is something that I think should make other people realize that they have a stake in this as well. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the question, how do we deal with this, is an important one. And I think probably an area where Raha and I would absolutely agree is that in the case of people who have violated the law, I think that I prefer a criminal justice solution. So in cases, for example, like uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed um, and you know, those who were held in Camp 7 in Gitmo, uh, for one thing, I think we need much more transparency with respect to Camp 7, where you have no transparency, unlike Camp 5 and Camp 6. Um, and the second thing is that you know, at the end of the day, I'm not sure that the military commissions are the way, way to deal with those. Um, in part, a lot of our early policy decisions, like the waterboarding of KSM, I think forced us into a military commission's approach to it. Uh, but I'd like to see criminals dealt with in a criminal justice system. But not all these problems will be criminal justice problems. Uh, combatants picked up on a battlefield have not necessarily broken French law or American law. And that's where preventive detention becomes absolutely important, and we need a framework for addressing it. Do you mind if I quickly respond to that? Yeah, quickly, then I want to go to Dowie to okay. make it. Yeah. I, I, just, I just want to point out the history of the law of war, and this is very important. Um, you know, when when, when we're talking about non-state actors, they are almost by definition in many circumstances breaking the local laws in engaging in hostilities and other unlawful acts because they are not given what's called a combatant's privilege. Um, and so I don't think that that's true that they, that they are, you know, in fact, it was in the, in the development of the laws of war, it was expected that the local domestic authorities would deal with these individuals in a criminal justice system in that way. And um, most, of the, most of the provisions in the Geneva Conventions in the third and the fourth Geneva Convention have to do with international armed conflict and dealing with uh, prisoners of war who are, who are very, it's a very different animal in that sense. So I just think it's important for us to be, to be clear about those legal precedents and, and how this has played out historically. Uh, and the, the quick response, because I'm sure we'll have a much broader discussion, is this is where the, the phenomenon of state collapse plays such a role. When you don't really have a meaningful state to engage in uh, you know, criminal justice prosecution, I think you're actually left with a broader dilemma. And this is a, that's a good point, actually, to go to Dawit, because Dawit, you, you've worked in probably a couple of dozen African countries. You've been an African a government official, military official. Um, clearly, in a case like Mali, which is close to a failed state, you don't have a, a government that can deal with these problems in the, in the way you're talking about, Raha. But even in a place like Nigeria, which is more firmly, uh, has, a more, has, has a stronger tradition of jurisprudence, when you're dealing with Boko Haram, um, the government uh, has some questions to ask when they uh, identify and capture somebody who they believe to be a member who hasn't been firing an, AP, an RPG in, in, in plain sight. Why don't you give us the, the lay of the land for that on, on, uh, in Africa? Thank you. So we, go, we come back to Africa and we go. <laughs> uh, and talk about anything, other points you want to address, sir. There are many Guantanamos in Africa, as you Make know. Make sure you push so this thing so you have a yeah, the, show the green light on so people can hear you. Yeah, that's you. Many Guantanamos in Africa. There are uh, preventive detention in Africa is a, the, a popular, a very preferred choice for autocrats there. So it's, it's interpreted. Okay. It, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a little it's interpreted in a very broad way. So many countries have got in Africa have got this preventive detention, and it's of course abused. Yeah? And preventive detention usually means uh, torture. It means indefinite detention. So it has been used uh, uh, in many cases to benefit the autocrats. So it's a dictatorship. So it's 
it's, it is a, a very uh, sensitive topic, and particularly after the 9-11, it has been the trend for many African countries to uh, uh, have this kind of law, uh, anti-terrorist law. And that anti-terrorist law has been also been very broadly interpreted to include uh, political oppositions, <laughs> those who... Uh, who exercise their political freedom. So it has been, in, a certain, in some ways, it has been a very repressive method uh, for many countries. So there are many Guantanamos. Uh, Guantanamo here is, a, uh, is in a free country, a democratic country, so it, we can talk about it, we can discuss about it. Those people in Africa, even in, 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 in areas where there are no conflicts, they are being arbitrarily detained on a daily basis, so nobody talks about them. So there are many, many cases there. So that's one, one issue. The other issue I just want to uh, raise now is, from, what I, from my reading, the French, France has got a preventive detention law um, in its own country for, for uh, dangerous uh, people. Um, if France wants to invoke this law or uh, try to um, exercise this law, it would be extremely difficult. It would mean Malians transporting Malian detainees and putting them in France. So that's out of the question. But uh, what it can possibly do is uh, um, detain them. French troops detaining Malians in, in, in the territory of Mali. Uh, that's also a little bit complicated. It requires uh, a legal framework. Um, uh, probably international law, and international law um, is, again, in, in, interpreted in different ways. But I think it, in, in the final analysis, we, we come back to the, um, to the Malians handling the situation. What happens in many African countries, um, you, the captured people are the lucky people. The preferred method in conflict areas is to eliminate people, uh, to kill people, uh, whenever it is uh, uh, possible. Um, and those who have been captured are the lucky ones. Um, so they are usually uh, those who are captured are I either because uh, there are too many to be killed, or because there are independent watchers uh, uh, in the area, or because they want to bring them back to their side and use them to, to, to fight. So for many reasons, they, 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 for a few reasons, they bring them to their side. But again, the, to have a preventive detention, I'm quite sure Mali has got a prevent, preventive detention law. To have a preventive detention, the procedure is requires a democratic state, a democratic government, a government that can handle this kind of crisis. Does we have, do we have an independent judicial system? We, in most cases, we don't. Um, do we have the capacity, the resources uh, to, uh, maintain, uh, to, to, to maintain these, these people? Do we have the resources? Do we have the system? Do we have the freedom? Do we have the lawyers? Uh, so it's, it's a very complicated situation. And in some cases also people will ask, why do we keep these people in prison Why the rest of the people are starving? Why do we have to spend money on these people? So again, that uh, the values are not there. The legal system is not there. And the institutions to enforce the law are not there. So in the absence of all this, there is, is a dilemma. So probably uh, the option would be to, um, for the French to create a capacity for the Malian government and to oversee the, the detention um, probably that could be uh, one way that can be done in a very human way. Um, in many countries in, in Africa, uh, the supremacy of the international law is questioned. Um, the, the constitution is the primary, the primary law. There are laws, but the constitution is the guiding law for a country. So the, the international law doesn't usually um, effectively apply when it is not in the interest of the governments and of the, of the, of the, of the, of the government at the time. So the International Court of Justice, the Malian government has requested a reinvestigation uh, of the by the International Court of Justice. Probably those people who have been found uh, to have committed um, uh, violations of human rights law, uh, of, 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 uh, then probably they can be detained and by the International Court of Justice. Um, but that's also a little bit cumbersome. I think that is 
probably the preferred uh, the preferred method it's a very complicated situation in africa it's very complicated like cliff said in in um, in uh, in a situation like nigeria where almost half of the country is under the control of the jihadists um, and they kill at will anytime any place what does the government do huh? uh, that, that's the so in, in this kind of case, the preventive detention is there, but again, when you use it arbitrarily, then it, it breeds more anger, huh? uh, and uh, that might be counterproductive. So it's a very delicate game. In, in, in the entire Sahel region where we have this problem now, the Islamist problem, it is, it is a very delicate problem. It needs to be handled very delicately. Huh? Thank you. I'm going to start taking questions, so just indicate to me if you want to, and, and I'll, I'll watch around. I'll, I'll, I'll keep an order. Let me, but let me, uh, while we're waiting for that, we'll start. And I'll ask you, Raha, very specifically, what would you have the French do in Mali as they take prisoners? What, what procedure would you ask them to, uh, to under, undertake? No schadenfreude, just yeah. procedure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what I would say is in an armed conflict setting, you know, and, I, and I'm not, I, I have to confess I'm not an expert on Mali um, or the, the ongoing conflict there, but... I think that, you know, in such situations, you know, assuming, for example, as David said, that, you know, we don't have a functioning criminal justice system or independent uh, judiciary, um, you know, as authorized, usually what's required is as authorized by domestic law, the French could engage in some detention operations with appropriate safeguards um, for the detainees. So, for example, promptly providing reasons for um, their detention, um, access to counsel. There, Israelis have done this, by the way, in, in, in uh, analogous situations. Um, access to independent judicial review for these detainees. I think with these uh, appellate processes as well. Um, so what I would say is, in those circumstances, uh, with appropriate procedures, the French could engage in detention operations in conjunction with Malian. But I, I, I tend to agree with Dawit that, that this ought to be something that primarily is done by the Malians, if, if possible. You both agree with that? Um, well, I, I agree with the one part of it in that, that uh, says that the French would be authorized to engage in detention operations. I, I largely disagree with the rest. Um, I don't think um, that, so, so first l let me focus on the parts that I disagree with. Um, I, I, I think when there is clearly a state of armed conflict in parts of Mali that the French are participating in. and in so far as they're participating in, in that, they are entitled to target the enemy, and they are entitled to detain the enemy. Um, there is judicial review is not a feature of that. Uh, right to counsel is not a feature of that. And criminal justice is not pre presumptively a feature of that either. I would prefer that the French engage in their own detentions rather in, than delegating them to um, Malian forces. Um, in other words, I would want a country that's engaged in an armed conflict to have the guts and courage to engage in the detention operations that are ancillary to and a part of that armed conflict. Now, the Europeans, as a group of countries, uh, and uh, I, this is not schadenfreude, this is um, a reality, have for a long time had a proxy that has enabled them to get rid of them, you know, get themselves out of the detention business. And the proxy is us. Um, and, you know, they don't have to do detention operations because we do it for them. Um, and that's what happened in Afghanistan. You know, European countries just, you know, all of the European countries who were there, none of them did detention operations. We did the detention operations. And we had our proxy, in turn, which was the Afghan government, which we constituted, um, in order to help us with that and increasingly have turned over more and more of that, that function to them. Um, so, you know, I fault us for becoming the new Europeans. But we, I should emphasize that we are the new Europeans, and the old Europeans are actually further out along the spectrum than we are. And they have a real problem with, the, you know, they, they, with this idea that you can wage war without, you know, without engaging in detention operations. And, and, and so I would say the laws of war, um, including the laws of non-international armed conflict, um, do provide a framework in which to do this. We are not talking about long-term detention. Presumably, Mali, French are not going to be involved in Mali, in, a, in, a, in, in Malian hostilities for a long period of time. Detention is simply part of 
conflict and they should, you know, if you're gonna go into a country, you should be prepared to do your detentions yourself. Uh, let's see, but let me, um, again, I wanna take questions from you if you have them, so just alert me if you do. During World War II, we took tens and thousands of German and Japanese prisoners and detained them. Not one, as far as I know, had a right to counsel. On what basis do you think there's a right to counsel suddenly now, not just for lawful combatants, but even more so for unlawful combatants? Should unlawful combatants really have more rights than lawful combatants have had in the past? Um, so the, the um, first of all, I, I don't believe that, you know, generally speaking, a right to counsel is a feature of non-criminal detention in, in the law of war context. Um, and I don't believe that for lawful combatants or unlawful combatants. It's just, not, it's just not traditionally a part of the regime, except to the extent that you prosecute them for war crimes, um, at which point um, there is an inherent right to counsel in that, fe in, in, in that relationship uh, or in, in that prosecution. I do believe, um, ho however, there is an intervening event between World War II and now, and it's the Supreme Court's Boumediene decision, um, which applies um, to Guantanamo um, and treats uh, Guantanamo and, and, and creates habeas corpus jurisdiction for the federal courts at Guanta over detentions that take place in Guantanamo. Um, clearly, it is impossible to have a um, meaningful habeas process in the absence of some, uh, whether you call it a right to counsel or access to counsel or the ability of the courts to have the benefit of the detainees being represented by counsel. Uh, David Reams, who's sitting over here, has represented, been one of the counsels who's represented a lot of Guantanamo detainees and, and helped them litigate their cases. I value that function a lot, actually, and I've, I've, you know, I think the longer term detentions, the longer you're going to have a detention regime, uh, and the Malian regime, the, the situation in Mali is one where I imagine the detention operations would be very brief, but if you're talking about a, a long term detention project like the United States has been engaged in, um, I do think the procedures that have developed around Guantanamo um, and the habeas regime that's developed around Guantanamo has been constructive in a lot of ways. And I think the judicial review has been constructive in a lot of ways. And a right to counsel is part of that. You, unless yeah. someone has a question, I'd like to respond yeah, because I think exactly. this is a really important point. Um, you know, it's we. I, I can see up here and say what I believe about right to counsel and independent judicial review, and Ben has his own views on that, but I think it'd be good if we were specific about the law on this. Um, when we're talking about World War II and interstate armed conflict, there are particular Geneva Conventions that apply to that, um, namely the most relevant ones being the Third and Fourth Geneva Conventions and the detentions provision with, within those. Um, the Third Convention providing detention for prisoners of war, Fourth uh, uh, Geneva Convention providing detention for civilians who may pose a security threat to the occupying power um, or the state. And so when we're talking about non-international armed conflict as a general matter, those conventions don't apply. So it's not just a matter of fact that somehow the laws of war authorize these detentions until the end of hostilities. Um, we have to look at specific provisions of the laws of war. Typically what is a baseline requirement is what's in common article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which does not provide for a detention regime. It provides for minimum requirements when treating detainees that are in the custody. So there is implied that there will be some detention, right? But it doesn't provide the authorities for that detention or the limits on that detention. So we have to look in other areas um, and other sources of law for figuring that out. Our view is that when we're talking about non-international armed conflict, we can't just presume that everyone that comes within our power is an unlawful combatant. Some may be civilians, and in fact, we have to presume under the laws of war that they are civilians entitled to protection, um, which is why we have judicial review and right to counsel, which is why the Israelis went in that direction, which is why I think the court in Boumediene acted the way that they did in these particular situations, um, and which is why I think 
the fundamental problem of Guantanamo exists as it did today. You know, we were told in the beginning that everyone at Guantanamo was the worst of the worst. That turned out not to be true. Um, it turned out almost to be the opposite of true. And so uh, I think that that judicial review, that process that needs to be in place is to recognize the fact that in a non-international armed conflict, in contrast to World War II, we're dealing with individuals who, who aren't wearing uniforms, who very, very well may have nothing to do with an armed conflict and may have nothing to do with hostilities whatsoever. Uh, well, let me just do one thing. I want to ask you, David, to help me clarify the distinctions between the positions. What are sort of the options, the, the range of options we have here? But just one one point I want to make, and uh, I think because I think it's important to throw in here, when you say that the people that those incarcerated at Guantanamo have, have largely, or I think you're implying, have largely been not dangerous actors. We have no fewer than 167 detainees who have been released from Guantanamo, who have returned to the battlefield. Uh, including one who was killed in Syria just this week. So we know we have released people from Guantanamo who have gone out and killed innocent people. I don't think we should forget that because we are empowering these people to commit acts of murder. I would and that's not that number, but I, I Well, what number would you give? Well, I would say that if you look at, since 2009, the releases provided by the Director of National Intelligence, we only have two confirmed cases of recidivism, one suspected case of recidivism under the D Director of National Intelligence estimate. Anyhow, we can, we can have that discussion, but I, I will can see the point that some Guantanamo detainees may have gone back to the fight, if you want to call it like in the common parlance. Um, but I don't think that, you know, that justifies the idea that we need to collectively just detain everyone um, out of the mere suspicion or fear that some individuals within that collective group may end up engaging in hostilities. That's why we have a process in place. The process in place is there to determine who is dangerous, who's a threat to the state, and who is not. And without that process in place, what we end up doing is oftentimes just engaging in collective detention operations, which I think is, is neither lawful nor in the interest of our national security.